before. I mean, I can, but if I download it and put it onto YouTube, it will take it down because it says it's copyright infringement on the History Channel. Um, so that way I just record around the videos and they will stay up on YouTube. Um, but that's why I couldn't record that part. Uh, your names should still be recorded, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but, yeah. So, Ulysses S. Grant had some definite strengths, but he also had some definite weaknesses. Um, the one thing we can say is that he's the only president that was the most successful at killing the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, you can't really kill it. It's one of those things that always comes back and it comes back in waves of popularity and it began in 1866 and so he was able to get congress to agree uh to give him wartime powers and suspend some of the civil rights of americans this is why uh with the exception of bush jr and the war on terror it's very rare that we do this and usually there has to be a war and the reason for that is because we want to protect people's rights, right? Um, and the Force Act or the Enforcement Act suspended the writ of habeas corpus. It also uh, suspended your rights to a speedy and fair trial by a jury of your peers. So these are definitely assaults, right, on your on the on the Bill of Rights and your constitutional liberties and and um, rights at the time. The reason he needed to do that uh, was because in order to arrest the Klan or, or arrest people for violence that they had committed, there was a huge amount of white Southerners that were Klan members. And these county courthouses could not get through them fast enough and uh, were having to release people because it was unconstitutional to keep them keep them detained uh, without charging them. So by suspending that writ of habeas corpus and suspending some of those uh, civil liberties and, and rights in the Force Act, Ulysses S. Grant was able to go down into the South, particularly North Carolina and Tennessee, and um, root out kind of the power structure of the Ku Klux Klan and charge them and uh, kill them, basically. Uh, I mean, he didn't kill the person. Uh, he didn't kill anybody, but he did, um, at least not in this instance, right? He was a, he was a Civil War general. Um, he was able to almost completely get rid of it. Like I said, you can't completely get rid of it. There's always going to be one or two hanger-ons, right? But they're completely underground at this point, and they're not active at all. And they won't be active again until 1910, 1912. Uh, they don't announce their activity until um, 1915 with the burning of a cross at Stone uh, Mountain in Georgia. But, like I said, he was the one who was able to do it. He also had a lot of help with that in the fact that Republicans still controlled both houses of Congress. You see, when he's elected, 1868, uh, Andrew Johnson had just barely survived his impeachment and he was a Southerner, and he really messed with Reconstruction. He messed it up. Reconstruction was a failure for several reasons, uh, but it was a failure nonetheless. And so in walks Grant in 1868, and that we're trying, you know, we're adding the Southern states back into the Union, but there was only really Northern Democrats that opposed Republicans in Congress. Uh, and they are more likely to side with more stringent acceptance of Southern states um, than, say, Andrew Johnson was. So Ulysses S. Grant has a very popular, uh, he is very popular, so he gets a majority, I mean, a lot of the popular vote. Um, and almost every single eligible black voter voted for Ulysses S. Grant, and you can see why. Um, but Republicans still control both houses of Congress, so he was able to get that, that force act uh, signed and passed. Now, as they add in Southern states, right, Southern states are added back to the Union. They have to accept the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They have to write up a, a constitution 
incorporating that into their state account, state constitution and that is going to provide more diversity politically in the houses of congress so you're going to see more southern democrats coming in and towards the end of ulysses S. grant's second term the second term is full of scandal right as they said ulysses S. Grant probably was not a part of any of this uh, but his friends were you know guilt by association if you hang out with criminals maybe you're a criminal right not unlike a certain former u.s president um but there was i mean the secretary of the interior secretary of treasury secretary of the navy right all these people are embezzling large amounts of money so the republican party is in disarray really on how to deal with this image of scandal and uh, as the election nears in 1876, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden square off, and Samuel Tilden wins the popular vote. And as I'm sure you are aware, that doesn't mean you win win, right? There are three states in uh, contested, and there's a, back, there's a backroom deal. I mean, there's an electoral commission, but the backroom deal is they give all their electoral votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. They're all southern states, so that they would vote for a Republican is highly questionable. But gives all the electoral votes to Republican, to Rutherford B. Hayes. And then, in exchange for that, Rutherford B. Hayes ends Reconstruction. And which means he is going to withdraw all federal troops from those three states. Those are the last three states that had federal troops in them. Now, why were federal troops still in the South anyway? Because until uh, the you had been allowed back into the Union, until you had demonstrated that you had, quote, changed your ways, um, there was the federal troops would stay there to enforce the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And later on, the Voting Rights Acts and the Civil Rights Amendments that, they, uh, that Congress passed under Ulysses S. Grant. Now, as you know, uh, the white supremacists of the South or the white Southerners in the South that were allowed clemency, right, were basically pardoned in mass under uh, Andrew Johnson, were taking control quickly. And those were the last three states that they didn't have control of. So he ends Reconstruction to gain the presidency and leaves the South to their own devices. And it's very shortly after that that the Dixiecrats of the South, which is what we call Southern Democrats of the time period, uh, take control of all the state's legislatures and uh, governorships and institute in mass black codes, uh, Jim Crow era laws, legislation that makes it legal to make African-American second-class citizens in the South. Uh, and so these are this is kind of where we are, all right? And we'll get to the politics of Rutherford B. Hayes, although there isn't a whole lot of them. <laughs> um, this kicks off a period of very lackadaisical presidents. They are inept. They are afraid to issue out any executive authority. I mean, it is a major shift from Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant, right? And you see a series of presidents that are like, oh, it should be hands off, you know, laissez-faire, not just economy, but everything else. And that is um, dangerous, right? Because someone will fill the power vacuum. And in this case, it's rich men, okay? So reconstruction's over in the South. This creates what we call push and pull factors for migrations. And migrations, of course, are, of people are usually a combination of both. There's got to be something pushing you away from your home and something pulling you to somewhere else. Usually when you say if one side of that equation, it doesn't, people don't move, right? Because at this time people will have to walk literally or they can take a train. But in the South, they're gonna do a lot of walking. Um, so what is pushing people? Uh, African-Americans, obviously, violence, threats of violence, black codes, Jim Crow, right? And they do move in mass to the northern cities where they see industrialists setting up factories so that they can have jobs there. 
call that the Great Migration. Unfortunately, what they imagine as the, quote, promised land of the north doesn't really exist. Um, there's not a lot of Klan up there. There's not Jim Crow laws. Excuse me. There are still racial prejudice, and there is still segregation. But it is somewhat safer, right, to be in the north. And there are more economic opportunities because basically you, if in the south, you're farming. That's it. That's like your one uh, occupation that is available to most people. Whereas in the north, you can go and join the masses of unskilled laborers and, and work at a factory and have regular income. Um, and they do develop, you know, um, cultural enclaves, ethnic enclaves, which are parts of the city neighborhoods that all have one, they're monocultural. And so you can kind of create your own little area, your own little place um, in which you get treated at least a lot better than you would in the South. Not ideal, but better, right? Um, and what are some of the pull factors that pull people away or pull people to the West? Um, African-Americans who do want to farm and don't want to move to the city, they go West. There's the Homestead Act, which grants 150 acres to anyone who stays on land and makes improvements for five years. Right. So that is free land up for grabs. So you do see a lot of farmers moving west, especially with the lack of reconstruction, especially after reconstruction ends. That's a big pull factor, free land. Um, opportunities, right? Lack of the Klan. Uh, and more racial equality. The West does tend to have more racial equality because it is so under inhabited. There are not a lot of people out there that you depend on your neighbors and it becomes more important for survival than it does on racial prejudice, right? So those are some of the push-pull factors. There's also immigrants that wanna move out West, farmers, um, they come for the industries that are out West. Um, they they do a lot of those things. So what's pulling people out west is these four main uh, industries: mining, farming, ranching, and railroad. Uh, lumber is kind of under you could put that under ranching or even mining. And they draw different groups of people, right, for different reasons. Mining, there are a lot of uh, semi-precious metal veins throughout the west, southwest in particular. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of silver mines, tin, zinc, copper, right? A lot of those, uh, like I said, uh, precious metals or semi, semi precious metals, sorry. Uh, and then, you know, the gold vein in California that's under the Sierra Nevadas that caused the gold rush of the 1840s. Uh, so all of that's out there and mining companies are hiring. And uh, people who are good with explosives are in high demand. People who tend to be good with explosives happen to be usually Asian immigrants or Irish immigrants. And then it goes down to kind of size. In fact, um, I mean, again, this is a stereotype and I apologize for that, but it tends to be at this time period that Asian immigrants and Irish immigrants are shorter than your average American, period, white or black. Okay. Um, again, not everybody. That just tends to be what it is at the time. And Americans already before, you know, just past the American Revolution were on average two inches taller than Europeans. So um, they tended to utilize people who were shorter in stature and who had experience with explosives in mining. And a lot of the impacts, which we'll talk about, you know, further, further on in the course or further on in this lecture, uh, there were no environmentalists in the 1870s. And so these miners just had zero care about the impact they were having on the land that they were blowing up or running off, uh, you know, excess material into rivers that didn't bother them. And we'll see that shortly. Uh, lumber, right? You have mostly Pacific Northwest is all forest. And so you do see large groups of immigrants coming in as skilled lumberjacks. And these tend to be, tend to be uh, Northern Europeans. So your Swedes, Scandinavians, mostly Swedes, Norway, Finland, Denmark, right? And that's why you get states that have accents that are more Scandinavian, like Minnesota, 
Wisconsin, uh, North Dakota, right? And they still have these accents. Uh, we have accents, right? Texans tend to have accents. If you're from the South, you have an accent. Um, if you're from New England, you definitely have an accent. So these accents come from a lot of these immigrants who moved into these areas to do these jobs and their language that they brought with them carried over, right? And if you learn English as an adult, you will always have an accent. But if you learn English as a child, you will not. And it's the same vice versa. Now, oil will come a little bit later, right? 10 years later or so, and we will start uh, digging for oil, um, oil wells, using oil wells, Rockefeller in particular, right? Uh, Standard oil will come a little bit later. It also has a huge impact on the environment, as you can imagine. Uh, and farmers and ranchers usually uh, mix between both. So you have a farmer, and the difference is a farmer makes his money, his income, off growing something in the ground, right? But that doesn't mean he doesn't also have cattle, pigs, horse, you know, those types. He doesn't have animals as well. And most of that, his farming is for income, but he also has to feed his family too. So he uses that mix of, you know, he has his own, his own garden, et cetera. Um, ranching's the same way. Uh, ranchers make their income off livestock. It, you know, whether it's cattle or sheep or pigs or horses or whatnot, you make your money off animals. You also probably have a small farm because you've got to feed your family. So that's why I say they, they kind of mix together. Both of those two, though, are going to compete for water sources. And this is one of the few things that kind of differentiates them from miners or uh, lumbers. But all of them have draws. So in other words, you can't mine if there isn't that metal there. You can't be a lumberjack there isn't a forest to cut down. You can't be a farmer or a rancher if you don't have access to fresh water. So they are going to kind of spread out. But these are the industries that are pulling people out there. And railroads, right? And railroads are huge. So it talked about in the video that the Transcontinental Railroad is almost complete, right? And it's going to meet in Utah, and there's a whole section on this. But you have to have people to build it. And so the Union Pacific uh, and the Southern Pacific, and I can't remember which one does which side, so uh, bear with me on that, hire a lot of immigrants. They hire African Americans that are looking for work because this isn't necessarily skilled labor. This is brute strength, right? And this is, can you keep doing this day after day after day? And they will hire anybody that will work, okay? But it tends to be those three, those two groups, because they pay them less, right? Not for a good reason, trust me. Um, so moving on. In the South, uh, people are leaving. We talked about reconstruction um, and what's going on in the quote, new South. But sharecropping and tenant farming are pretty much all that's left. If you don't already own land as an African-American in the South, you are going to be forced to do one of these two options for farming. There's very little industry in the South that will hire um, Southern Blacks. They're going to try and hire Civil War veterans. There's always this idea of you hire uh, of white supremacy, of trying to make sure that there's nobody unemployed before you even look at you know, the other portion of the population. So sharecropping and tenant farming, similar you are farming land that doesn't belong to you. But in sharecropping, you farm the land, you take your goods to market, you sell them. Let's say you get $1,000 for that. Then the person who owns the land takes 25% of that off the top. Right? So that's $250 gone to the owner of the land. Okay, you've got $750 left. Then you have to pay all your bills. Okay, so that comes out to, well, we'll just, again, I'm just throwing numbers out here, $500. So you're left with $250 to set farming for the next year. But we already know it costs $500 a year to farm. So you're then in debt $250 and you go to sell again. And let's hope that you get another $1,000, right? 
you give your twenty five your two hundred fifty dollars back to the landowner. You're left with seven fifty. The debts that you have from last year is two hundred fifty. You're down to five hundred, and it costs you five hundred dollars to farm. So you now have zero money to start the next year. So you start the next year, and you're in debt five hundred dollars. Then you sell for a thousand. Give 250 to them, pay off, you're still in debt, $500, right? And you see how this perpetuates the fact that you will never, ever get ahead. And that's how the system is designed. Okay. Uh, Sharecropping, the way it should have worked is you sell your product and then you take out your bills, right? So let's say you got $1,000, you pay off the 500, there's $500 left. You're the owner of the property, you should get 25% of that. Okay, but he's not. He's getting 50% of that, right, for doing nothing. So that's sharecropping. And a lot of these contracts are set up in that way so that whoever is actually doing the work is very rarely getting paid and almost always in debt. Tenant farming is a similar situation, but it works differently. You pay a flat rate of rent every year for that piece of land that you're going to farm. You don't have to worry about how much you're going to get paid at the end, nothing. You just pay a flat, a flat rate. However, these things change from year to year, and the contracts are set up to, of course, always benefit the white landowner. So the end of the year, you feel like you've made, say you sell your product, you get $1,000, you've already paid your rent up front, which would be a flat fee. We'll say it's ten, you know, uh, $100 a year to rent. Um, and then the farmer realizes, or the, the landowner realizes that you've made $400. Well, then he's going to up the rent next year. Now the rent next year is going to be $300. So tenant farming, although a different system, is set up to screw the farmer either way. Okay, so that's kind of the difference between those two and the way that was functioning. So moving on to the railroad. Um, we talked about, you know, the Transcontinental Railroad. And at first you would think like Promontory Point, Utah, the guy, you know, the company coming from the east has got a lot further to go than the country than the company coming from California. But remember, we already have railroad infrastructure in the north. So we have everything up to Kansas City or St. Louis, Missouri. We just need to get from Missouri, Kansas over to Utah. So it actually is about the same number of miles. Uh, the difference is miles coming from the east were mostly flat prairie land, except for the Rockies. The miles coming from the west were almost all through mountains. So the Western Company had a lot more uh, hardships in trying to get it, to meet that demand. Um, and again, this is passed by, it's funded by the federal government and passed under Lincoln's tenure as president under the Transcontinental Railroad Act. And how do they pay for it? Um, I'm going to drop a diagram and hopefully show it to you on Monday. Uh, but our country is land rich but cash poor, meaning we have tons and tons of land out west, but we don't have a lot of cash, right? Um, so what we do is we um, give away the land in lieu of payment for the railroad companies. So they do it in a checkerboard pattern. So for every mile, let's say you go one mile as a railroad company, that mile belongs to the government. The next mile belongs to you. The mile after that goes to the government. The mile after that belongs to you. And they give them in these squares in that checkerboard pattern. And then the company, the railroad company, can then turn around and sell it to prospectors or settlers or whatnot. And that's how they get their money. Okay, That's how they pay for the railroad. Um, the government had to keep good portion, you know, half of it at least, because they had to be able to put railroad depots there and not be dependent on these companies to build them and maintain them. Um, that is ended, what ended up happening, but um, that is how they were paying for the railroad. Uh, and then travel, I mean, when you take, at the end of the Transcontinental Railroad, we had travel time from the Atlantic to the Pacific before would take you six to eight months. Travel time after the Transcontinental Railroad was built would take you at most 14 days. So a huge cut down in travel. And everywhere that the railroad went, the telegram went. 
So you now you could communicate from coast to coast in a matter of seconds. Um, and so this just blew up communications and um, trade and any kind of um, expansion of power, of business, of commerce, of communication, of all of that, right? And so people are going to um, be more willing to move out west when they can still communicate very quickly with their relatives in the east, okay? And then settlement, again, we said that draws in uh, people who are looking through the Homestead Act to get free land grants. Uh, labor for the railroad is going to be mostly Im immigrants. And almost immediately after the railroad is finished, the government passes an anti-Chinese immigration act because they're so thoughtful like that. Um, and it's just terrible. It's just abject racism. They, you know, basically you've come here, you've built what we want you to, but don't bring your families. No, no. Now you need to go back home. Um, it's just ridiculous. Um, but that is the state of uh, American politics at the time. And not a lot's changed. But anyway, <laughs> um, so labor, excuse me, was definitely part of the railroad and intensive immigrant labor, right? The impacts onto the environment, particularly with relationship to the Native Americans, was severe. Okay, not only do you draw settlers and settlements into areas that had been already sectioned off as reservations for Native American tribes through treaties signed by the U.S. government um, that they somehow forgot. <laughs> um, and they're still doing this today, by the way. But they allow these white settlers to move in there, right, which leads to the Dawes Act, which we'll get to next time. But the biggest impact really is that you have these massive herds of buffalo, right? These are big, you know, two ton, well, one ton, two, 3,000 pound animals. Um, they're stubborn. They do what they want. They go where they want. They're kind of dumb, right? But these huge, huge herds of them uh, just go wherever they want in the plains as they always have for millennia. And all of a sudden there's a railroad there. Well, they don't care. Right. They just walk right over it. And they have been they recorded that at one point it took three days to get an entire herd of buffalo across this one section of railroad. So that's how many there were in existence. And the railroad were annoyed by this. Um, they were probably causing some damage. And also they were slowing down shipping and, and, and travel. So they hired buffalo hunters whose sole purpose was to get rid of the buffalo. We're not conserving meat. We're not taking trophies. They are literally paid per buffalo that they And through this decade or two of just a free-for-all of buffalo hunting, they drive them to almost near extinction. Now, from an environmentalist standpoint, that's absolutely terrible. From a Native American standpoint, that's deadly because that's their food source. That's their everything source. That's what they make their housing out of. That's where they uh, get their meat from, that's their clothing, their weapons. I mean, all of these things rely on the buffalo and they're being killed to extinction. So that drives just the Native American relationship with the U.S. government south and everything uh, comes apart, right? And it becomes much more destructive, which we'll get into next time. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'll go ahead and stop recording. Do you guys have any questions?